Good morning. I hope you can hear me. Can you? Because I cannot speak too loud. Uh, again, it's a privilege to be with you, those that are here and those online. Wonderful music. Praise the Lord for people that have this gift. I can hear very well, but my voice, I had, three, I had a few interventions on my vocal cords. My voice is not very good. But I enjoy listening. I mean, there will be a lot of music in heaven. Praise the Lord for that. Um, last night, we talked a little about the need for prayer. People think that they know prayer and they believe in prayer. But very few actually really pray. People do pray short, routine prayers or crisis prayers. When they go through a disease, when they go through a tragedy, they pray. Otherwise, people don't really pray a lot. But the key of power is in prayer. And the disciples were people of prayer. In the Bible, says in the book of Acts chapter 2, they were committed to prayer, devoted to prayer. And all people in the Bible, all people of faith, have been people of prayer. If our church would pray more, we would experience more power. I could give you a bunch of examples. I don't want to do that too much because then, like last night, we'll never get to the sermon. But you know, you don't need to hear the sermon necessarily. Before we start, let's bow our heads again for another word of prayer. Father, in humbleness, we thank you for this privilege to come in your presence. We acknowledge that we depend on you and we pray that your spirit will open the world and touch our hearts that we may understand what you want to tell us, and we may be transformed. May it all be for your glory and for your work. In Jesus' name and merits we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus is coming soon, sooner than we think. Sooner than we think. The question is not if Jesus is coming. The question is, are we ready? That's the question. My wife used to have a business in Kentucky and in Wisconsin taking care of veterans. And she had the inspections. And they would come like once a month, and they would announce, we are coming Tuesday at 2 o'clock. So it's easy when they let you know, you prepare. But once a year, they came without announcing. Could have been March, could have been August, could have been December, could have been a Monday, could have been a Sunday, could have been a Wednesday. Could have been 6 a.m. or 2 p.m. or 11 p.m. You never knew when they came. And about five of them came. And for four or five hours, they inspected everything. The water temperature, the home temperature, the food uh, labels, if, they, if the food is expired, the temperature in the refrigerator, the smoke detectors, the fire extinguisher, the escaping route, the medication chart, they checked everything. And every time, no exception. They told my wife, you are always ready. We inspect so many homes, and we find so many non-compliances. And we have to find them, and some of them are pretty big, and we have to fire them and close the business. And they said, for some reason, when we come here, everything is in perfect shape. And they asked her. She got a certification five years every year as the best facility in the state of Kentucky. And they asked her, they said, what do you do that you are always ready? And you know what my wife answered always. She said, I don't wait for you to come to get ready. I am ready every day as you would come that day. How do you prepare for the second coming? You don't wait for the final crisis to prepare. You prepare every day as it was the day of the second coming. You understand? People think... I just read today in the morning from the book of Acts. And in chapter 6, Ellen White says that some people wait for big events to be involved in God's work. And she says, they will never come. You need to be faithful in small daily matters. And as you are faithful in small daily matters that really don't matter, they are so small... God would give you a little bigger. And as you are faithful in those, God will give you bigger. And slowly he trains you. 
The same she says with crisis. People wait for a big crisis to prepare. And God would prepare you in small crises. For instance, you have a job problem, you have a health problem, you have a whatever small crisis in your life. If you despair in that crisis, how are you going to make it in the final crisis that the Bible says there will be a crisis like never in history? Jesus says, there will, quoting the book of Daniel, there will be a crisis like never before and it will never be again. The biggest crisis in the world history the biggest crisis in history. If we struggle with a small problem, we pray and we say, I, I, I got no answer. Well, what should I do? God doesn't answer. If our faith is waving in the small crisis, what are you going to do in the biggest crisis of all times? You don't wait for the crisis to prepare. If you don't keep up, the Bible says, with those who walk, how are you going to keep up with those on horses? You don't prepare for the final crisis. In the final crisis. You don't prepare for the final exam. The night before the exam. You don't prepare for the Olympics. The night before the Olympics. It just doesn't happen. You don't get a medical degree. After one day of school. It just doesn't happen. You don't develop your muscles. To lift up 200 weights. If you never lifted up anything. Unless you learn to walk with God today. You will not walk with God tomorrow. She says people of faith. They learned to hear the voice of God. Isn't that something? It's, I'm going to read a quotation before we start. This is still the introduction, sorry. I'm going to read the quotation to you that is extremely powerful. Uh, it says here, very interesting, very interesting. I found it finally. It says here, Those that make Christ their daily continual companion and the familiar friend, those that walk with God, they will feel the powers of an unseen world around them. They will feel the presence of God around them and they will be assimilated. Okay, this should be off. And the other mic should be off. And they will be assimilated into God's image. Now listen carefully. For testimonies 616 and the next one. Listen carefully. The faces of men and women that walk with God and talk with God. And he talks to me. You know, you remember the song? The faces of men and women that talk with God and walk with God. <clears throat> to them, the invisible world is a continual reality. They express the peace of God and they carry with them the atmosphere of heaven. And then the paragraph continues. Whatever crisis they go through, they have peace because they are never alone. They walk with God. They talk with God. Do you walk with God and talk with God? And they carry with them an atmosphere of heaven. They have continual peace because God is with them. They may be burning on the stake. And they are still singing. They may be killed with rocks. And they are looking to heaven and saying, I see Jesus. Because they have peace. I remember in 1977, March 4th, there was an earthquake in Romania. It was 7 point, I don't remember, 4, 5, 6 on Richter scale. 1 minute and whatever, 16, 20 seconds. Uh, many people got killed in that earthquake in Romania. It was a Friday night. We came from church. We got home. We lived in a... Uh, apartment building at the fourth story, at the fourth floor. And we got up there, and before going to sleep, the building started to move. And my mom, my mom started to scream, and to, Lord, forgive my sins, so I'll be safe. Please forgive my sins. My father said, honey, that's a little too late. You should have done that every day. <laughs> you, you don't solve your problem in the crisis. And my father started to sing, Rock of ages, clear for me. My mom says, how can you sing during the earthquake? And my father said, I open my mouth and it comes. <laughs> and my father said, let's sing. And my father said to my mom, 10,000 may come, may, may fall on my right, 1,000 on my left. If God wants us to be alive, we'll be alive. If God wants us to die, we'll see Jesus in a few seconds at the resurrection day. Praise the Lord. He was peaceful. And he said, let's sing. But the piano was moving, you know. And my sister said, I cannot play the piano. And I said, my father said, you have a voice. Let's sing, Rock of Ages. And somebody knocked in the door. And my father says, during the earthquake, somebody knocks in the door. 
He goes to open the door. The next door neighbor, Nutsika and Mitika, uh, big people, very, 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 very big people, you know. And she says, Mr. Goya, let me come in with my family. And my father says, everybody runs down the stairs. Why don't you run down the stairs? It's not safe. The stairs may collapse. Downstairs, the, the building collapses on people. If you are in the building, you are not safe. If you are down, you are not safe. If the building falls on you, you are not safe. Let me come in. And my father says, why would you want to come in? And she said, this is the single safe place in the whole building. And my father said, why would you say that? And she said, we know heaven lives in this home. When we fight, you folks sing and pray. When we are in trouble, you come and pray for us. When we don't have food, you come and bring us food. We can see God's presence with you. We know that God is with you. Let us come in your home. Isn't that something? Remember the quotation. People that walk with God continually, around them it's an atmosphere of heaven. The disciples, after the, after the upper room, after the Pentecost experience, people knew that they walked with Jesus. You remember? It says in the book of Acts that people could see God's presence in them. Do people see God's presence in our people today? You look to the market, you go in Walmart or whatever, Myers, I don't care, Kroger, whatever store, and you see an Adventist and non-Adventist. What's the difference? Let me tell you the difference. I was driving from Chicago to Wisconsin. I came to the Romanian church some time ago when they were between pastors to preach, but I was supposed to run back to go to Monroe Church Plan to preach. And after I finished pre preaching in Addison, I was driving fast, speeding, to get to Monroe, and as I was driving fast, I got to Rockford, and there is a toll, an I-pass toll booth. And, and there was a lady ahead of me in a car. And I was looking for four tolls. Which one has less cars? That one has only one car. When I got behind her, she was like, she was fabricating the money then. I said, come on, why it takes you so long? And she was like, waiting and waiting, and she would not pay the toll, and she would not pay the toll. And I was like, ah. Lord, give me patience and give it to me now. And she, and she was not paying the toll. And then she got the window down and she threw the money in that funnel and the money fell down on the street and she backed off the car and I had to back off the car. And I was like, oh, and doo -doo. I blew the horn. And she went back and she waved. Oh, why, why don't you? And then she got back in the car and then she left the car and she went to the lady in the booth and she talked to the lady and she looked in her purse and she paid again. And said, lady, why don't you have the money ready? I am late to preach. And I got really angry. And my wife says, honey, what if she comes to evangelism in Monroe? And she remembers you talking bad right now. Calm down, you are a pastor. I said, I cannot calm down. Look how slow she is. And then she left finally. Praise the Lord. I got to the booth. And why? I want you to pay. The lady says, you don't need to pay. She paid for you. I said, what? She told us that her son was in a car accident, and she's stressed, and she's shaking, and she, her hand was shaking, and that you are so patient waiting for her, she's going to pay for you. <laughs> so patient waiting for her. My question is, how do we reflect Jesus' character towards our neighbor? That's the test of Christianity. Not the fact that you come to church. Don't get me wrong, you should come to church. I cannot stand people who stay home instead of coming to church. I'm not judging them. But, you know, I hear people, it's raining, I don't go to church today. Those are not trials, come on. You follow me? No offense, I'm not talking about anybody specifically. Oh, I cannot go to church. My cat is not feeling good. I love my cat, I love my dog. But go to church if you want, you know, God's presence with you. I didn't study today because I am, I'm late for school. Wake up early. Not trying to rebuke anybody, but your priorities. Talk about your God. Whatever comes first in your life, that's what you worship. Whatever comes between you and God, that's your God. And so, talking about that, how do we know that we really worship God? It's not enough to go to church. It's not enough to keep Sabbath. Just because you don't work on Sabbath doesn't make you an Adventist. Lazy people never work. That doesn't make them holy. Just because we don't work on Sabbath and we eat tofu doesn't make us Adventists. Don't get me wrong, 
We should not work on Sabbath. We should go to church. We should keep Sabbath. We should eat healthy. We should do all of this. It's in the Bible. But unless this would have a transforming power in our lives, they are just called doctrines. Unless our heart is changed, unless we are filled with God's presence, unless we talk with God and walk with God and depend on Him continually, we are not Christians. If these messages don't change us, why do we go to church? If you heard in a lifetime 1,000 sermons and we are the same, struggling, why do we listen to the sermons? If we prayed 2,000 prayers in a lifetime and those prayers didn't change you, why do you pray? It tells me that then church and prayer and study have no power. And my prayer and my study of the word should have power, transforming power. You follow me? I'm not saying that we should instantly be saints, but I am saying that we should slowly grow from the children to the stature of fullness of Christ. And there should be, as Elena White says, spiritual growth towards maturity. You follow me? Now, you cannot change self. I cannot change self. I cannot change my wife. Don't even try to change your wife. You'll have a miserable life. You cannot change anybody. You cannot change yourself. But God can change a heart. God is able to give us a new heart. He promised that. And God cannot lie. But we have a problem. We rely too much on human efforts and too little on God's presence. I have the quotations here with me. Hopefully today we manage to see them. Going back, how do you prepare for the second coming? If when you get in line to the iPass or in Walmart, you lose your temper. When your boss bothers you a little and you lose your temper. Can it be that God asks your boss to bother you? Yes. If you pray today for patience and somebody bothers you, God sends them to bother you so you learn patience. God is answering your prayer. So be careful what you pray for. Yes. So, how do we grow? How do we prepare for the second coming? If we don't prepare today, do you think you are going to prepare when Jesus comes in final crisis? Preparation starts today. Preparation starts today. So let me, finally, I want to start the sermon. Let me explain this. We don't know what is happening behind the scenes. But we do know that churches... And Catholicism, and I'm not criticizing people. I'm talking about big things, uh, institutions and events. Catholicism and governments, we do know that they get together and they plan things. We do know that for a fact. Just one year ago, in October, they met in California and also in Belgium, in Europe, and they planned the unity. And six major churches united and they signed the document. And we do have a copy of the document where the Lutherans verbally and in writing apologized for the Protestantism and for the Reformation. And they said it was a mistake, we should go back to the mother church. They apologized. If Luther would know that, he would turn around in his grave. We don't know that churches have no more mission. The question is, do we still have a mission? And so, talking about that, you look around to the events happening, you look around to freedoms disappearing, you look around to evangelism, you look around to revivals here and there. If I gave you stories, what happened in Kenya, what happened in Japan, what happened in France, what happened in Italy, what happened in North Germany, what happened... If I give you stories, you would know that we experience revival. And this is not only in Africa. This is all over. It is in America. It is in Europe. It is all over. It is in Germany. It is in France. All over in secular countries. And I could give you stories. I don't have time for them. For instance, in Kenya, about 10, 11 pastors met together because in Nairobi, while in the rest of Kenya, church grows with over 28%, in Nairobi, church grows only with 3.2%. Because Nairobi, 11 million people, is very secular. All businesses happen there, not countryside. And people have no time for church. People that are in business and they do well, some, sometimes they don't care too much about church. And so, in Nairobi, they, 10, 11 pastors met together and they prayed. And after about two, three months of prayer, they got a phone call from a different pastor that was a non-denominational church pastor. And he said, studying, I discovered that Sabbath is Saturday, not Sunday. And then I googled and I found out that you keep Saturday. Would you please send me some materials to learn about Sabbath? They sent him materials. He had two churches. One was about 600 members. One was about 450 members. He gave them Bible studies. The pastor and his two churches got baptized. 
But that's the beginning of the story. Six months later, he went to the pastor's area, pastor's meeting, all pastors from all churches, from all denominations from Nairobi, over 2,000 pastors. And he gave them all 2,000 a copy of the Bible studies. He made 2,000 copies. 196 non-Adventist pastors got baptized. Over 300,000 people from their churches got baptized. And that story keeps repeating in other and other and other and other places. There is revival. The Holy Spirit is coming. The latter rain drops started to fall. The Bible will be fulfilled. The question is not if Jesus comes. The question is, are you ready? And so, saying that, Jesus is coming soon. We know that. But in this process of preparation for the second coming, there are people who are ready and there are people who they are busy with other things. I am not saying that we should give up job. I am not saying that you should give up school. I am saying that wherever you go, whatever you do, do it in a way that you honor God. When you go to work, show that type of integrity and that type of love and that type of behavior that will show Christ in you. At home, when nobody sees you except your spouse, behave as Christ behaves. And you cannot do that in your power unless you are filled with God's presence, with the Holy Spirit. Reading today in the morning from chapter 6 from the book of Acts, it says that we have a, a, a vital need for the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the work will not close without the Holy Spirit. And as the Holy Spirit started the work, the latter rain will be more abundant than the early rain. And the work is going to close with greater power than it started. And then she says, only those who devote their life to service and pray will receive the Holy Spirit, will be ready and finish the work. The others, the Holy Spirit is going to pass by. What about you and me? The Holy Spirit is going to pass by. Listen, in Matthew 10, Jesus starts, and from 10 to 24 to 25, actually, Jesus starts talking about the second coming. And as Jesus talks about the second coming, in Matthew 24 and 25 is the culmination, the climax of his speech. And in Matthew 10, when he starts talking about it, he says to the disciples, go first to the lost sheep of Israel. He doesn't say go to preach the gospel to the world. He says go to the church. Why would Jesus ask us to preach to the church first? It's like preaching to the choir. Because whatever I say, you know. There is nothing that I can say. Adventist church, they are experts in theory. But then, Ellen White explains. And she says, uh, uh, commenting on Matthew chapter 10, verse 6 and 7. When Jesus says go first to the uh, to Israel and tell them that the kingdom is at hand. She says, the church is sleeping. She says, the church is sleeping. Now, who is the church? Oh, the pastor is sleeping. The conference is sleeping. The union is sleeping. No, the church is not the institution. It's not the leadership. The church is the people. It's you and me. Just for the fact that you are tempted to judge somebody else, it tells me that you are sleeping. Because if you are awake, you say, Lord of heaven, wake me up. You would not have time to judge anybody if you are awake. You follow me? The church is sleeping. You and me. Now, I want to uh, give you a quotation. Uh, extremely powerful. Yeah, uh, oh, yeah, 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 but I'm not there yet. <laughs> give me one second. It starts with Satan is poison. I follow it. Satan is poisoning the atmosphere. Talking about diseases and pandemics and so on. Satan is poisoning the atmosphere. He is working in our world. And we are dependent upon God for our lives in the present and for eternal lives. And being in the position that we are right now, we need to be awake, not asleep. Fully devoted to God and to his work. Wholly converted, wholly consecrated to God with no reservation. Totally dependent on God. And then she says, but we seem to sit as paralyzed. That's what she says in Second uh, Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 52. We seem to be paralyzed. God of heaven, wake us up. Close quotation. That's what she says, not me. We seem to be paralyzed. We see the, the signs around and we just, you know, sleeping. And so, Jesus says, go first to the church. Wake them up because they need to prepare. Jesus is coming, coming again, coming. Jesus is coming, finally. All generations, all prophets, all people of faith have been waiting for this event. 
And right now, when Jesus is coming, we fall asleep. Like the ten virgins. They are waiting and waiting, and before the coming, they... This is not the time to sleep. This is the time to be fully awake. This is the time to pray like never before. This is the time to study like never before. This is the time to finish the work and pray that God would help you use every opportunity that he gives you to finish the work. We are that generation that will see Jesus on the cloud. Don't you want to be in heaven? The Holy Spirit is pleading with the church to wake up. And so... The church is the people. Don't wait for the church to wake up. You need to wake up. I want to I wanna continue. Uh, talking about, we can go to the slide. By the sleeping disciples is represented what? A sleeping church when God's day is near. It is a time of dark clouds and darkness when to be asleep is dangerous. Second Testimonies, page 205. Christ is at the door. Men and women are in the last hours of probation. Yet they are careless and foolish. Preachers have no power to wake them up because the preachers themselves are snoring. Sleeping preachers preaching to sleeping people. Gospel Workers, page 121. Wow. How many virgins were sleeping? All? Also the wise, not only the foolish? What does he say in Revelation chapter 3 about the church? Miserable. Filthy. I don't want to be critical because this is God's church. We love Jesus. I do believe that we love God. I do believe that we have the doctrines. But I, I think what she refers to, she says we live right before the final events. And we really cannot play church. It's not that the church is bad. It's not that the people are bad. It's just that we don't process that the events are going to be so fast. The Spirit of Prophet says rapid succession. These two words, rapid succession. The events will be so fast that you'll have no time to prepare unless we take it seriously and we don't play games with the Holy Spirit and we prepare now. You follow me? We live the last final events. By the way, Jesus talks from Matthew 10 to Matthew 25. And when he gets to Matthew 24, he says there that in the last week of his life, Jesus walked to Jerusalem and Jesus stopped on the Mount of Olives. Have you been there, anybody? It's beautiful. And on the Mount of Olives, you have a valley and then you have a hill and then is Jerusalem. And Jesus, from the top of Mount of Olives, looks over the Gena that is in the valley where they would throw all the dead bodies and the people that were crucified and people that were killed and the garbage and everything from Jerusalem over the Gena that was the dirt place, the, how you call it to, in our days, the, the dump field or whatever? Landfield, yeah. They look over the Gena and then Jerusalem, beautiful marble and gold, one of the miracles of the world. And they show Jesus, you see, how beautiful. And Jesus tells them, there will be not one stone over the other one. And they, for them, that's the end of the world. The temple was the center of worship. God's presence, Shekinah. You know, that cannot be, cannot be, that Jerusalem can never be destroyed. That's the temple. And Jesus says, it's not going to stay one stone over the other one. And for them, it's the end of the world. And they say, when is going to happen? What is this? And they say, listen carefully to the words. When is going to happen? People are concerned with time instead of being concerned with preparation. When? And Jesus says, it's none of your business to know the times. Nobody knows the day and the hour except God. Your business is he, he says, pray and watch. Be ready. What is your part? People ask me, when? 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 I don't know when. You know, I don't know when. But I know Jesus is coming soon. Sooner than we think, like a thief. And our business is to be ready. Because if you wait for when, you'll never prepare. And so Jesus says, none, none of your business to know when. Watch and pray and be ready. And then Jesus talks about their second question. When is going to happen and what is the sign? And Jesus gives them the sign. And Jesus starts with the fig. He says, when you see the fig, you remember? Then you know the summer is coming. And then he says, these are the signs. And Jesus starts talking about wars and rumors of wars and earthquake and, and pestilence or pandemics and this and that and that. And then Jesus says, this is not the end. This is the beginning of birth pains. You remember? 
And they says the gospel will be preached to all nations, and then the end will come. And Jesus says there will be, a, when you see the abomination of desolation, you remember the Bible verses. He says it's going to be a crisis like never before, and then the gospel will be preached, and then the end will come. Okay, and so, when Jesus says this is the beginning of the birth pains, people see the virus, and they say, this is terrible. Brother and sister, this is not terrible. This is the beginning. It's going to be worse. Did you hear what I said? Oh, this is going to pass. Yes, and another one worse is going to come. And that's going to pass, and another one worse. And then it's going to come two, and then five, and then ten. And the Bible says that people are going to lose their minds. People are going to despair. People are going to become so desperate that they will become wild, hate each other, kill each other. Break your store and take everything. Break your house and take everything. People are going to go crazy of, of crisis. You see them going and buying everything from the stores. I took a picture in Walmart three months ago. Empty shelves. I've never seen that except in Romania during communism. People despair and they lose the thinking. You follow me? If you think that this is the end, this is the beginning of the pain. When my wife was pregnant, she was so happy. Hey, we will have a baby in the first month. In the fourth month, she, ah, he started to move. And, oh, oh, you know, he's moving. Ah, it, it hurts. That's so comfortable. In the seventh month, she was like, oh, I can hardly walk. The closer you get to the birth, the more uncomfortable the church is. You follow me? And then when she got in the ninth month, when the contraction started, she said, oh, I have contractions. And they happen every four hours. And then they happen every two hours. And then every one hour, every half an hour, every 15 minutes. And they were closer to each other. And they were bigger in pain intensity and longer in duration so they increased in frequency intensity and strength you follow me to the point that she was in terrible pain that's what's going to happen with these terrible things wars and pandemics and everything and crisis and economical collapse and so on. it's going to be more and more and more and more and two and then three and then five and then it's going to the point that people will lose it if you don't make it now, how are you going to make it then? If you don't learn to depend on God and God alone, and you depend on your way of solving things, how are you going to make it? If we don't learn to walk with God and depend in prayer to live the righteous shall live by, if you don't know faith, how are you going to survive? And so... Jesus says, it's going to be this, but this is not the end. This is the beginning. It's going to be like the birth pains. And then the gospel will be preached. Then the end will come. We could talk about the preaching of the gospel. We don't have time. Our time is almost done. But let's talk about preparation because that's essential. And then Jesus tells them how to prepare. And Jesus doesn't say, he says, pray and watch. But then Jesus tells them in parables how to prepare. And he gives, gives them five parables. He gives them the fig parable. You remember? What is the fig parable? He looks to the fig, and the fig tree is supposed to have what? Fruits. And the tree has a bunch of leaves, but no fruits. And then I compare leaves with talk, a lot of talk, but no results. And Jesus says, you'll know them by there. And what are the fruits? The fruits of the? Well, we do try to have fruits. I'm trying really hard. Brother and sister, an apple tree will never make bananas. Regardless how hard the tree may try, he will always make apples. Whatever you do to the apple tree will never make bananas, trust me. You can keep trying, good luck. Doesn't matter what fertilizer you put. An apple tree would make apples, smaller or bigger, red or yellow, apples, never bananas. In Galatians chapter 5, there are two types of fruits. The fruits of the human nature, and the fruits of the Spirit. And Ellen White says, regardless how hard we try, we'll never produce the fruits of the Spirit unless the Spirit lives in us. Because they are the fruits of the Spirit, not yours. So the Spirit can produce the fruits of the Spirit. For you to produce the fruits of the Spirit, it will never happen. You'll produce the fruits of the human nature, apples. You need the Spirit living in you to produce the fruits of the Spirit. You follow me? And Jesus says, if the tree didn't produce, he said, let me try again. Let me fertilize. Let me water it. Let me prune it. Let me do whatever it takes. Maybe next year. And he tried again second. And then third year, making an analogy with Israel because Jesus spent three years and a half with them. And then if the tree doesn't produce, I'm going to cut the tree. And he doesn't tell if he cut the tree or not. But the question is, if the tree doesn't produce, what's going to happen to the tree? 
You follow me? Because that's ultimately the test. Do you produce fruits or not? The tree that produces fruits will be saved. The tree that doesn't will be cut off. And then the second parable is talking, if you remember carefully, about the faithful and unfaithful servant. So the master comes and says to the servant, I'm going to go in a far country, referring to Jesus, and I want you to feed the others, give them food. And we know that men don't live only with bread, but they live with any word that comes from God's mouth. You remember? Give them food. And he lives. And the servant starts faithfully feeding the others. But then the servant, instead of being concerned with service, he starts being concerned with time. And he says, the master is late. And he stops feeding. And by the time he starts feeding the others, he starts beating the others. Because those people who don't work, they abuse. People who work, they don't have time to abuse the others in the church. You follow me? I remember when we built a church in Romania during communism, it was against the law. So we would meet in the night, 11, 12, 1 a.m., and we worked without any light, without any power tools, because if the police caught us, we'll be arrested. In fact, my father was taken to the police station many times. And we worked, and there were two guys, I'm not going to tell you the name, that never worked. Everybody worked. Children. I have a scar on my chest even today. I was on the walls, and I jumped from this wall to that wall, and the two-by-four caught me here. From that time, when I was small, I still have a scar. The pastor, the wife of the pastor, the elders, the deacons, the church members, everybody worked in that church construction. There were two guys that they were down, and they were, that wall is not straight. That color is terrible. You do such a poor job, guys. And my father stopped, and my father said, you have time to criticize us because you do nothing. Get on the walls, and you have no more time to criticize. You follow me? People who don't serve, they abuse the others. People who work, they have no time for abuse because they are busy working. Nehemiah says, I cannot come down. I have better things to do. And so going back to the story, the servant stopped feeding the others and stopped drinking and abusing the others. And he says when the master came, what would he do to that servant? You follow me? How do you know that you are ready for the second coming? If you work or not, if you serve or not, whatever God gave you to do, do it. Wherever you are, wherever God put you, be a servant, because that will decide your destiny. And then the third parable is the parable of the talents. He gave one one talent, he gave one two talents, he gave one five talents, and those who used the talents, they were blessed and multiplied. And those who didn't, they lost eternal life. He doesn't have everybody to be a pastor, but whatever talents God gave you, use them for God's honor. Remember those talents that were used were blessed and multiplied. Only what you give God will be blessed and multiplied. What you keep will be lost. Remember, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever is willing to lose his life will save it. Whoever throws his bread on the water will come back many times. You follow me? Peter says, Lord, we have given up all. Jesus says, you'll get 100 times here and eternal life. You don't lose by serving God. The kid who gave his fish and his bread. Many people had food, but they didn't give it away. They thought, how could my little food help a big crowd? But that kid, only his bread and fish were blessed and multiplied. Use whatever God gave you to be a blessing for the society. Use whatever gifts you have, time, music, computers, I don't know, whatever gifts you have and multiply them to show Christ's character, because Jesus is coming soon. And then he gives them the parable of the ten virgins, the fourth one. In the ten virgins parable, you're supposed to have light. You're supposed to have a lamp, and the light it comes from having what in the lamp? Oil, that is the symbol for the Holy Spirit. You are supposed to have fire that depends on oil. Fire in the Bible represents zeal, passion for God's work. Do you still have that fire in you? I'm going, da, 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 da. wake up, brother. Pom, 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 pom. Put your heart in what you do. When you sing, it's not funeral. Enjoy the song. When you go to, oh, we go to evangelism. If you don't enjoy it, stay home. When you go to evangelism, put your heart. We had work B. Six people came to work B. If you'd come them to a movie night, 150 people would come. I'm not sure about it, but I'm saying. 
When we went to clean the park, 40 people came. I said, this is strange. I call you to clean the church and nobody shows up. I call you to clean the garbage in the park, everybody shows up. Doesn't make any sense. Oh, pastor, it was fun. Can we do it again? What fun? To clean the park? Oh, I want to do it again. I said, okay, we'll clean the park again next Sunday. The point is, put your heart in what you do. Because you serve Jesus. He put his heart in what he did for you. You have that fire? If you don't have the fire, it's because you don't have the Holy Spirit. You don't have the oil. Now, listen carefully. Very important. Why did they need the, the oil, the Holy Spirit? Why? Because people don't know that part. In Palestine, in tradition, in that time, when they had weddings, weddings happened, started in the night late and lasted a few days. In that time, streets had no names. You can read it in the tra tradition in the history. Streets had no names like uh, Highway 83. Nah, -uh. No names, no numbers, nothing. And streets, I've been there. Very confusing. If you lived in the city, you would know your way around. But if you came from a different city in the night, no light, no names, you would get lost. And so it was a tradition, it says in the history, that young people from the groom's family would take lamps and go to the intersections to light the way to the wedding hall. So nobody would be lost. What is the job of the virgins? Jesus says, you are the light, you are the light of the world, you light, remember, let your light shine in the dark. You are the light of the world. You are supposed to be the light so nobody around you would get lost. You are supposed to show the way to the wedding hall. If we don't light, why are we Christians? Or are we Christians? Virgins that were a light, the Holy, the Holy Spirit, and they were lighting, they were saved. The others, they were out. That's how you know if you are in or out. And then the last parable, Jesus talks about the second coming. And he divides them into groups, the fifth one. The sheep and the goats. And he say, wonderful servants, you went to church, you ate broccoli, you returned tight, you kept Sabbath, and you knew the state of the dead. Come in. Does he, does he say that? Mm -mm, not in my Bible. Those are good things. Don't get me wrong. Because somebody in a different country in Europe told me, you are against Sabbath because you say that I said, I'm not against Sabbath. I believe in Sabbath. But if you keep Sabbath and you don't serve and you do no mission and you don't care, it doesn't help you. Pharisees kept Sabbath too. You follow me? You must do these things and you should not let the other things undone. And so Jesus says, I was naked, I was poor, I was in prison. People in prison don't deserve help. They are lawbreakers. Nevertheless, Jesus says, you care for them. And they said, we have never seen you, Lord, in prison or naked or thirsty or hungry. He says, when you did it for them, you did it for me. How do you know that you are ready? When you have a heart for people. If you love people the way God loves people, you are ready. And Elena says, by praying that God would pour his love into us for people, the Holy Spirit is going to fill us. And the more we pray for people, the more we are going to invest in people. And the more we invest in people, the more they will listen to us and trust us. And then we can tell them the gospel. You follow me? It's Christ's method alone in, this, in, in ministry of healing. Christ's method alone. Jesus first loved them and talked to them and ate to them and healed them and listened to them and won their friendship. He mingled with them and won their trust. And then after that, he said, follow me. You cannot give evangelism before you listen to your neighbor. You cannot give evangelism before you pray for your neighbor, before you build some friendship and some trust and you bring him some tomatoes. You follow me? You give him a cookie. I know he's not healthy, but you know the neighbor is going to eat the cookie. You make cookies, you share with your neighbor. Hey, neighbor, we... Uh, so we had a friend, we had a, we had a church member, very rich, very well-to-do. I'm not going to give you name or location. Very well-to-do. Very, very well-to-do. And, and he told me, Pastor... Poor people listen because they come to evangelism because you give them food. But rich people don't need food. And he says, come visit me in my neighborhood. I drove there, my Kia Rio that was beaten all over. A friend of mine hit the back. My father-in-law hit the right side. Somebody hit the left side. The brakes broke. The cover from the brakes, that, that, that steel cover was touching the, 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 the rotors. I was like, shh, shh, shh. When I came to church, everybody in the church knew. The pastor is coming because they could hear. 
oh, the pastor is here. And, then, and so he says, come and visit me. I drove the Kia Rio in that rich neighborhood uh, around Crystal Lake, close to Chicago here. I drove, and when I entered that neighborhood, big homes, multi-million dollar homes around the lake, Ferrari, Maserati, Lexus, Mercedes, Kia Rio. And I get to him, I says, look around. These people don't need the gospel. These people are private. They don't talk to anybody. They don't even greet you. Nobody knows anybody. They will never come to church if I invite them to evangelism. I told him, if you don't care for them, you should go out, get out of the church. What? I said, if you don't love those people that Jesus loves, you are not an Adventist. And I know you love Jesus, and I know you care for them, but what do you do for them? Well, evangelism doesn't work. I said, pray. God has a method that you don't. Pray. Well, I'm praying for them. How long? I don't know. That's because you don't pray. Oh, yeah, I'm praying. No. How long? I don't know. Then, because you don't pray. Let me explain. When you fast five minutes, you don't know. When you fast three days, you do know. When you pray five minutes, you don't know. When you pray three days, you do know. That means that you didn't really pray for them. Because if you really pray, you know. Well, how long do you want me to pray? Three months. Continually. I said, no, two hours every morning. You are crazy, pastor. How could I pray two hours every morning for them? I said, just do it. After about a month of prayer, he called me and he says, I'm born an Adventist. My father has been a missionary 32 years. He says, I've never experienced so much prayer in my life and I've never sensed God's power before in my life. And he said to me, since I started to pray for them, God started to give me ideas. His wife from Greece cooks unbelievable food. When they invited me, I said in my mind, brother, invite me every day, I'm coming. The food, they had stuffed cabbage rolls and kalamata olives and, and a Mediterranean salad, and they had baklava, and they had, I mean, I, if I describe the food, you'll get water in your mouth. Unbelievable food. And I love food. And so he said, God inspired me to invite the neighbors to a Greek food. And he said, this neighbor, they would drive far to a good restaurant to just experiment new foods. So he said, God impressed me. I said, praise the Lord in my mind. When you invite them, invite me too. And so next Sunday, they had their 25th anniversary from their marriage. So he called the neighbor. Good morning. Good morning. The neighbor was washing his Porsche. Hey, it's our anniversary. Would you come and join us? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm busy. Hey, my wife is from Greece and she cooked this. And he said, God put in my mind to describe the food. When he started to describe the food, the neighbor stopped from washing the Porsche. Opened his mouth. He says, I guess I could come. The neighbor came and he said, in my house, nobody eats before you pray. Well, I don't believe in God. That's okay. Close your eyes. I will pray. And then he says, what do you want me to pray for? He says, well, my wife and I are separated for five years. Our children are teenagers. They spend their all day on the telephone. They never talk to us. They are ashamed, embarrassed to even talk to us. And pray for my family. So my friend prayed for his family, prayed for the food, and then they ate. After they ate, he says, let's play a game. And the rich guy says, What? Let's play a game. We are adults. We don't play games. Is why not? When is the last time you played the game? Well, when I was in college. Let's play a game. You have too much stress. I don't have time. I am, I'm busy. Let's play a game. Half an hour. No. 20 minutes. No. 15 minutes. Come on. Let's have a little fun. Let's relax. Let the stress go. I guess I could do it 10 minutes. He said, we play Settlers of Catan and Monopoly. And my church member said, I can beat anybody. But I allowed him to beat me so he would enjoy the game. And he beat me and he said, let's do it again. And he said, we played for about two hours. And he won game after game. And he was like, yeah. And then my church member told me, he said, he walked home literally, physically, whistling. <laughs> and he got in the house. As he was entering his house, the neighbor, whistling, the children looked to him and said, dad, are you okay? He says, why? We have never seen you whistling in your life. What's wrong with you? He says, I went to the neighbor. We ate Greek food and we played games. And the kids, are you crazy? You played games? You never play with us. You are always on your computer. We played games and I beat him. And, and Sunday, I'm going back. We are going to eat again Greek food and we are going to play games again. And the kids, dad, can we come? I guess you can. Then the wife says, what did you do to them? The kids talk to you and they don't talk to me. Well, I told them that we ate Greek food and we played games. And the wife says, you did what? We played games. And the wife says, can I come too? Long story short, next Sunday, the whole family goes there. They pray, they eat, they play. This neighbor tells the other neighbor that they are playing golf together. 
And he says, you know, my kids are in drugs. Can I come to another neighbor? 11 millionaires, families met for six months every Sunday, praying for one another, and then they started Bible studies. And then I went there and baptized over 40 millionaires. Is it possible? Is it possible? God wants you to care for people as Jesus cares for people. How much do you literally, honestly pray for your neighbor? Do we spend time praying for our neighbors? I have neighbors that bother me to death. If my dogs would bark once, they call the police. I was tempted to hate them. I went and gave them chocolate and I started to pray for them. Nothing happened yet, but I'm still praying. Do you pray for your neighbors? Because if you don't, you need to ask yourself, do you have the Holy Spirit in you? God didn't put you there in that house that you have a house. God put you there in that house to be a light for those people. They may listen, they may not. None of your business. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. But your business is to pray for them. That's your business. Do you care for those people? That's how you prepare for the second coming. You don't prepare. Ellen White says, quote, in idle expectation, close quotation, these two words. She says, we don't wait for second coming in idle expectation. She says, we do the work that God gave us to do. How does we close the work? How does we finish? How th that's how we prepare. We finish the work that God gave us. We finish the work that God gave us. We preach the gospel. We use every opportunity. In every one of the five parables that God gave them to show how to prepare, the fig tree you are supposed to produce, the servant you are supposed to feed the others, the talents you are supposed to use the talents, the virgins you are supposed to be a light, the, the, the second coming judgment you are supposed to care for the poor and the naked. And the... In all those parables, the way you prepare, you serve. Jesus came to serve and he asked you to serve. That's how you prepare for the second coming. Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready? Are you ready? We didn't really went to the sermon. The sermon has 56 slides. We went to slide number five. It says there, Jesus says it's going to be like in the days of Noah. But then Jesus says, what did they do in the days of Noah? They ate they built homes they, in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. They planted gardens. They got married. What's wrong? Is it wrong to plant a garden? Is it wrong to build a house? Is it wrong to get married? Is it wrong to eat? Nothing wrong. What does it mean? It's called routine. People feel bad when they kill. People feel bad when they steal. But people don't feel bad when they plant a garden. People don't feel bad when they build a house. But this is what Jesus is saying. Get out of routine. There is no more time for routine. Because if you do every day what you did yesterday, I have a paragraph that says, I have it in the presentation, that says, if we do every day what we did the day before, we will never prepare. That's what Ellen White says. If we do every day what we did the day before, we will never prepare. It's called routine. You don't feel the need to change when you do nothing wrong. And every day you go to work, you come from work, you take a shower, you eat, you watch the news if you watch the bad news or crazy news, and then you go to sleep. And next morning you say a prayer, you study, if you study, some of us still do. And then you go to work and you come back and you don't, days are the same and now it was Christmas and now it's, it's Christmas again and year flies by before you know and you wonder, is it Tuesday or Wednesday? Because every day is the same. And if you don't go to work Tuesday, you think it's Friday or Saturday. Did it ever happen to you? Because every day is the same. It's a routine. And if you stay in routine before you know, you'll find yourself in the crisis. And people say to me, when I see the crisis, I prepare. You'll not see the crisis because the crisis is all around you and you don't see it. Because the crisis doesn't instantly grow. No earthquakes and then 300 earthquakes. No, it grows like birth pains. Gradually, one and then 10 and then 50 and then 100. And in time, in 50 years, 100 years, more and more and more and more. And we get used with the crisis and we think it's normal. It's a new normal. You get used with crisis. You get used with fires. You get used to tornadoes. You get used with economy crashing. You get used with viruses. You get used and you don't see it as a crisis. You see it as a new normal. Don't wait to see that crisis to prepare. Prepare today. 
It's like in the days of Noah. People got in routine and they didn't see the crisis. You follow me? Get out of routine. Make priority study. Make priority prayer. Make priority service. Put God first. Because these things are going to burn. Get out of routine. Anyway, we got to finish. When are you going to do that? I remember, brothers, I'm going to jump. Oh, by the way, jump to slide 17. The men of that generation were not all bad. They were worshippers of God. They went to church. They kept Sabbath and so on. By, by constant rejection, procrastination of the light, they didn't prepare. And then next slide. They manifested contempt. What means contempt? They ignored it. They ridiculed. For the warning, how? By doing what they have done before. By doing what they have done before. By persistent procrastination and rejection, they actually rejected the light. I'm going to jump to a slide somewhere in the presentation and I'm going to finish. I don't know where it is. That's uh, okay. It doesn't, it's not important. When I was young, when I was a kid, in second grade or whatever, third grade, when I would walk to the school, I would go through the little market where the bus for a town, for a village called Shimian, bus number nine, I'll never forget, was leaving from that spot. And as I would take a shortcut to the school, through the market, there was a, 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 a I don't know how to call it, like, like a, something like a cart that you push that had three wheels, and inside there were three containers with ice cream. There was a, a, a guy, old guy called Bayram Hassan from Turkey that was living in that city. And he pushed a cart, and in that cart there were three stainless steel containers with ice cream. And he, I'll never forget, I have the slide on the other presentation. Um, he sold pistachio ice cream, vanilla ice cream, and chocolate ice cream. The pistachio was to die for, really good. I know it's not healthy, but you know it was good. And, anyway, and that guy would scream all day long, with, from the bottom of his lungs. Today you pay. Tomorrow is free. I went and I paid my pistachio ice cream. And I went next day. I said, I want my free ice cream. And he says, today you pay. Tomorrow is free. I said, no, no, no. I came yesterday. That was to, uh, I came yesterday. Now I came today. And today is free. He says, no. Yesterday was yesterday. And you came today. And today you pay. Tomorrow is free. I said, yeah, you are right. It's not tomorrow. So I paid again. I came next day. I said, now I came tomorrow. He says, you came today again. <laughs> I said, come on, guy. I came tomorrow. Yesterday was today, and today is tomorrow. He says, no, yesterday was yesterday, and today is today. You need to come tomorrow. I said, when is tomorrow? He says, to nev tomorrow never comes. <laughs> Why do we think that we prepare tomorrow? If you really, really, with the bottom of your heart, want to prepare, why do you wait for tomorrow? If you want to prepare, prepare today. If you want to pray, pray today. Satan loves when you'll pray tomorrow. If you want to serve, serve today. Pray and say, Lord, give me wisdom what to do for my neighbor. And God is going to give it to you. If you want to study, study today. Because if you do it today, you'll do it tomorrow again. But if you don't do it today... Satan is going to keep you busy tomorrow too. Don't wait for tomorrow. Tomorrow doesn't belong to you and to me. Jesus is coming. Jesus is on his way. He is at the door. We are the last generation. We live the final events. We live the birth pains. that are going to intensify to the final event. It's time to wake up. God is calling you and me. To make a decision today. And you don't say I will do it. Because you cannot do it. I cannot do it. You say Lord I want to do it. Help me do it. I give you permission to do whatever it takes. Wake me up. You follow me? Let's pray. We, we passed 10 minutes. If you, if you don't forgive me that we passed 10 minutes. I will not come back. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven. What a privilege. We will see Jesus on the clouds. And we'll forget all this pain. And we'll bow down and put our crowns at his feet. 
and we will eternally spend time with you. But Father, please help us to understand that none of this is worth losing eternity. Please help us make a priority today of living a life of communion with you, of learning to walk with you and depend on you, of being filled with your spirit. Please help us today. We cannot do it, but we believe in you. We believe that you are waiting at the door, waiting for us. You are waiting at the door to enter. You are waiting for us to invite you in. So, Lord, please come in. We don't know how, but you do. We trust in you because we pray in Jesus' merits and in his name. And thank you, Lord. Amen.